this is our third session in this series called Genesis Frequently Asked Questions, Getting Down to Logistics. And, you know, if you think about it, secular scientists and evolutionists always try to find a way to discredit the Bible. And they do that by asking questions that many of us don't have the answers to, or don't, don't have the answers of even, you know, couldn't even understand where to begin. And if you don't rebut their theories, then that's good evidence for their cause, and it's right. So it's important that we do have answers. Now, it's, it's not critical that we prove them wrong. It's not a matter of wrong versus right, but it's truth. Truth is what matters because we don't want to just win an argument. The whole reason we do this is so that we can have answers for the faith that lies within us so we can reach out to people, share the truth of the gospel, and bring them to a knowledge of Christ. That's the important thing, not to win an argument. So keep that in mind as, as we go through this. But one of the questions that evolutionists ask all the time is, how did the animals spread out through the entire world on all the continents? So we're going to attempt to answer that tonight. But first, we're going to test your, your knowledge with a couple of couple of exams, right? A couple of exam questions. Everybody ready? Did kangaroos ever live in the Middle East? Maybe. Maybe. How many say yes? How many say no? There's a lot of you that didn't answer. Who doesn't care? <laughs> Okay, so let's think about this biblically because every, every scientific model that we have should start with this, right? Should start with God's word. So Noah was told by God to build an ark and to take two of every land animal and birds and creeping things on the ark. Are kangaroos land animals? Yes. Did they go on the ark? Yes. Yes. When the ark at the end of the flood landed in the mountains of Ararat, somewhere in the Middle East, were kangaroos on board? Did kangaroos get off the ark? So did kangaroos once live in the Middle East? Absolutely, that's great. So ready for another question? This will be easier. Okay, did penguins ever live in the Middle East? Yes. Okay, see I told you, a lot easier. And, and similar questions can be asked for polar bears, elephants, giraffes, any animal that no longer lives in the Middle East but those other places can all be tracked back to somewhere in the Middle East. So the question then remains that how did the kangaroos get to Australia and how did the penguins get to Antarctica? We're going to answer that, but first we're going to look at a, a mammal that's called the tapir. And a tapir is basically a, a pig-like mammal. It's got a, a prehensile snout like an elephant, only much shorter. And they live in several places, Central America, South America, but all the way over here in the Malayan Islands. And these are called split ranges for animals. And we see this type of distribution in not only plants, but all kinds of animals. Now from a biblical perspective, that's good evidence that these animals spread to these continents after the flood. From a secular point of view, they really don't have an answer for this. So as we'll see, creationists are really the only ones that can provide an answer to these split range animals. And when we think about it, there's really only just a few different theories out there <coughs> that you can present that kind of, that, that try to make sense of these split ranges and these animal migrations. And the first one is obviously evolution. Right, that's the evolutionists say they have an answer. And, and the answer to this is that similar species evolved in different places at about the same time. And now this has got a lot of yeah, this has got a lot of problems, doesn't it? Because not only would they have to evolve independently in all these different areas, but at the same time. But if you think about it, all their ancestral relatives, supposedly, that they evolved from also have the same split range problem, don't they? So you have to keep pushing this back, back, and back until all of a sudden you have 
the process of evolution starting from a single cell in multiple places all over the world at roughly the same time. So even evolutionists will say that this kind of is a, a, not a good theory because it's just statistically untenable. There's just no way that this could happen. And from our standpoint, evolution can't happen once, nonetheless, several different times in many different places across the continents. Another theory that people bring toward or bring up in this discussion is the plate tectonics theory. Now we've talked about this, but both creationists and evolutionists believe that at one point in time, the Earth was basically just one land mass. And whether you call that Pangea or whatever you want to call that. And then the evolutionists would say that animals then, uh, they, they evolved and they spread all over the continents here before they split up. And then they really don't have a, a reason why all these continent plates developed. They just did. And so they said that during millions and millions of years, slow, gradual continental drift, centimeters a year possibly or, or less, these continents started moving apart. And that's why you had animals that slowly, you know, there was a water that, that existed between the continents that was a barrier. And so that's why you have all these different animals. But if you think about it, this kind of presents a problem for creationists because we say that all of these land masses, these plates, occurred when the fountains of the great deep broke forth and the continents spread apart very rapidly and not slow millimeters per year, but maybe feet per second that these continents split apart. And, and what happened to the animals during the flood? They all died except for those on the ark. So this has problems for creationists so we have to disprove this particular theory. But it also has problems for evolutionists because they look at, this is, this is what would become then the northwestern part of the United States, Alaska, and this is the eastern part of Russia. Now, they believe that when, when these continents came together on the other side of the globe that we're seeing here, currently they're separated in, with Pangea by thousands of miles of ocean. And they said, according to, to evolutionists, those continents only came together within about the last 10 million years. Which is, if you think about it, when you're talking about billions of years, that's a fairly short time period in the evolutionary reckoning. So if those continents only came together in about the last 10 million years, there's some evidence that we have to deal with. Because on both sides of that narrow little strip of water that exists between Russia and Alaska now is called the Bering Strait. On both sides of the Bering Strait are fossils of the same plant species. And those fossils were supposedly captured in those rocks 150 million years ago, according to the evolutionists. So think about this then. You've got plants that were the same from the Jurassic period, 150 million years ago, on both sides of the Bering Strait, but those continents only came together within the last 10 million years. So there's still a split range problem then from the, the evolutionist, you know, tectonic plate problem. There are also various species of monkeys that we find all across the continents. Africa, South America, Central America, and then again in India and over into Southeast Asia. So it's not necessarily difficult to see how monkeys may have migrated from Africa, although very mountainous areas here in Saudi Arabia and Turkey, but okay, animals can migrate across land, so that maybe is how they got over here in India and Southeast Asia. But what about over here in the South America from Africa? According to evolutionists, those continents split apart millions of years before monkeys evolved. Because think about it, monkeys are supposed to be our closest relative, right, according to the evolutionists. So if these continents split apart millions of years before monkeys evolved, 
that doesn't explain that plate tectonic theory then, does it? From, from the evolution point of view. So that only allows then for them the, the possibility that these monkeys evolved independently on different continents at the same time, which is, again, untenable even in, in an evolutionist point of view. That really only leaves then two viable alternatives, and we're going to talk about those. One is the land bridges theory, and one is the floating raft theory. So we'll, we'll go into each one of these. But we have to start knowing that God's word is the source of truth. Now, I've said before, the Bible is not a scientific textbook. But whenever it does touch on science, it's never been proven wrong. So we can develop models to try to explain what happened in the Bible, but models change, they come and go as new evidence is, is presented. And man's beliefs, they're, they're rewritten all the time, they change all the time. But the Bible is unchanging. God's word is always the same. So then let's use the Bible, and we're going to see what the Bible says about biogeography, which is the study of where we find the different kinds of plants and animals throughout the, all the different continents. And where better to start than in the first book of the Bible, the book of Genesis, which is the foundation for basically every doctrine that we have. So let's begin here, Genesis 6, starting at verse 19 it says you are to bring into the ark two of all living creatures male and female to keep them alive with you Two of every kind of bird every kind of animal and every kind of creature that moves along the ground will come to you to be kept alive Now notice it says kind not species So within each one of these created kind were all the genetic diversity that we needed to to develop the animals that we currently have. All the animals that came off the ark aren't necessarily the animals that we have today, but we have the cat kind, for example. So Noah didn't have to take two of the lion, two of the tiger, two of the cheetah, two of the lynx. He would have just had to take two of the large cat kind that had then all the genetic diversity within the kind to get every other cat family that we have today. So you don't need that much room on the ark, right? If you, if you talk about kinds instead of species. So then Genesis 6, starting at verse 8, it says, Pairs of clean and unclean animals, of birds and of all creatures that move along the ground, came to Noah and entered the ark as God had commanded Noah. So the preservation of all the world's fauna and flora then were divinely controlled and not left up to man's fallible choices, right? He didn't say, no, you go pick the animals. God predetermined those animals that had the genetic diversity that he needed to give us the animals that we have today. So it wasn't just left up to chance. And then in Genesis 8, 3 to 4, it says, The water receded steadily from the earth, and at the end of the 150 days the water had gone down, and on the 17th day of the seventh month, the ark came to rest on the mountains of Ararat. Now notice it says the mountains of Ararat, not Mount Ararat. And many people mistakenly think that the ark is somewhere on Mount Ararat. But if you think about it, the name of that mountain was given much, many, many, many years after the flood. And no remnant of any existing topography existed after the flood. It was all destroyed, and so everything that we see, all the mountain ranges, were raised up after the flood. But people normally gave names or renamed things, common names that they knew before the flood. Look, for example, the Tigris and Euphrates River. They currently are in Iraq around Baghdad. We see the Tigris and Euphrates River in the Garden of Eden, but the original garden has been destroyed as lo along with the rivers because there were two more, right? The Pishon and the Gihon. Those are gone, but people renamed rivers with, you know, familiar names. 
So when we look at this, Ararat may just be a name that existed on some smaller, lower mountain range before the flood. Now, there are different names for different mountain chains in this area of Turkey and Iran and Iraq. There's the Pontic Mountains, the Kaskas, the Ellsberg, and the Zagros Mountains. Now, this is called the Armenian Highlands. This is the, the border of Turkey here. That's where many people think that the Ark is on Mount Ararat. But it's this entire region of mountain ranges then that are called the Mountains of Ararat. And even though there are some people that really think the Ark is on Mount Ararat, there's a lot of good evidence to think that there are some mountain ranges in Iran that is really the place where the Ark landed. Nonetheless, we know that the Ark landed somewhere out here in the Middle East. Now, Genesis 8, 19 says, All the animals and all the creatures that move along the ground and all the birds, everything that moves on the earth came out of the ark, one kind after the other. So they all got off the ark somewhere in the Middle East. Therefore, every animal, as we said, originated somewhere in the Middle East in these mountains. So then we, we see in Genesis 8, 15 to 17, it was God's intention then for all the animals and man to recolonize the earth. It says here, then God said to Noah, come out of the ark, you and your wife and your sons and their wives, bring out every kind of living creature that is with you, the birds, the animals, and all the creatures that move along the ground, so they can multiply on the earth and be fruitful and increase in number on it. So now all the animals are spreading out to repopulate, recolonize the earth. So let's just take a look from God's word, where the, the true starting point, the things that we know. Real quick summary. All animals on the earth today are part of the original kinds that came off the ark. They had plenty of genetic diversity then to, to get all the different species that we have today. They got off in the Middle East and the animals spread out to other parts of the world. Now, let's look at then the dog kind as an example. We had two dogs that came off the ark that represented all the dog kind that had all the genetic diversity, all the, all the different traits that we have in all the dogs today. So from that original dog kind, you would get things like the wolf, the dingo, the coyote, the Asiatic, and the African wild dogs, and then those genes would be distributed to subsequent generations. Now, we've seen this in the past, but let's just take the original two dogs that came off the ark, and let's just assume that their first litter of pups is just a moderate sized litter, six pups, and let's say there were three female and three male, and then the original two dogs plus the, the original pups in, in the next generation, we'd have eight different sets of parents that would have more dogs, let's say again, six dogs per each, and over time, in, like in the fourth generation, it would be 72 dogs. And by the fifth generation, there would be 102 dogs. And then over and over again, as these populations multiply, lots and lots of dogs. Lots of dogs. <laughs> Are they anything other than dogs? They're still dogs after all these generations, right? So let's look, we've, we've seen this. If these represented the original two dog kinds, we're just going to take the gene for hair length. So the, the allele for long hair is represented by L, S for short hair. So these original dogs had medium length hair, but they had the genes for both short and long hair. In the first generation, they could have a breed that had only short hair genes, still medium fur, and then one for long fur. Now, if you take another dog that only had genes for long fur, the gene for short hair is gone out of that population, and so all they can have is dogs with long hair. The only way to get medium length fur dogs or short hair dogs now are to reinsert the population for short hair dogs into that gene pool so they can pass those genes on to their ancestors. So this is how different genes can be truncated, if you will, out of the gene pool. And as dogs 
then spread across the continent. There were different variations, and they really resulted as a result of adaptation to their environment. So if you look at this, for example, in the cold regions, which may have happened after the Ice Age or during the Ice Age, those dogs that have long fur would have been much more adaptable to colder temperatures than dogs that had short fur. So if dogs that had short fur were not as fit and they died, they can't pass those genes on to the offspring. So what you see is only dogs with long fur live in the colder areas. Same thing can be said for dogs with short fur. They're better adapted to hotter environments, hotter temperatures. But again, they're still dogs. So we don't see fossils, though, of animals along their migratory path. That's another problem that evolution has presented to us. And where's all the fossil evidence that kangaroos have left from, us, from the, the Middle East down to Australia? Where's all the fossil evidence for those? Because if they migrated, there should certainly be fossils. That's a bad presupposition, and I think Paul's catching on to this. It's based on bad questions, because it's based on the fact that fossils form slowly, as evolutionists will tell you, and that fossils are inevitable. In other words, fossils will ultimately form every time. Now, we're going to conduct an experiment here. And I, I'm sorry, Tom and Steve, cat lovers, if there's other cat lovers, I apologize in advance. That's my experiments based on cats, right? My, my poor dead kitty here. Now, here's, here's my disclaimer. No real animals were used in this experiment, nor was any harm done to any real animal, okay? So it's, all the animal lovers, but we're not doing any damage to animals here. So let's just say that, that here's my cat, and, and he dies on day one. My poor kitty. On day three, it's just a little smellier than it was before. On day nine, it's a lot more smelly. Day 20, he said, my cat's already starting to decay here. Day 38, Part of my cat is now missing. Day 65, my cat's gone. What happened to my cat? Went back to dirt. It, it could have gone back to dirt. It could have been scavenged. Where's the fossil? Can't be fossil because there's nothing left. There's nothing left. Because fossilization requires rapid sedimentation or rapid burial, or else the animal's going to either decay or it's going to be scavenged and scattered. <coughs> now, there used to be millions of buffalo roaming the Great Plains. Do you know there are very few fossils of buffalo that we've ever found? It's because they were buried rapidly, quick enough to develop a fossil, to become a fossil. So the fossils that we find are fossils that parrot, fo fossils of buffalo kind, or the bovine kind that perished during the flood. Now, did you also know that we don't find any fossils of lions in the Middle East? Yet, we know that there were lions once in the Middle East. These are the ranges that you see in red of the historic distribution of lions, and then the blue are where the present distribution of the lion population is. Now, we know from, again, starting with God's word, 2 Kings 17, 24, it says, The king of Assyria brought people from Babylon, several other places here, and settled them in towns of Samaria to replace the Israelites. They took over Samaria and lived in its towns, and when they first lived there, they did not worship the Lord, so he sent lions among them, and they killed some of the people. We also see the account of Daniel in the lion's den that was in Babylon when they were taken into exile there. So we do know from God's word that lions used to live there. So don't just think that the, because of the lack of fossils or just because animals don't live in places that they once did, that they never did. In fact, the earliest depiction 
of a rural hunting lions occurs on a, on a basalt monument that's dated back to 3000 BC. Now the royal lion hunt was a very popular sporting event. And we see many of the rulers, especially in Assyria and Mesopotamia, that entertain fossil or a lion, lion hunts. Now, some of the most spectacular depictions of these lion hunts are on these stone panels. We see these first in a palace of a king named Ashurnasirpal, who was in the city of Nimrud in present-day Iraq. Then, more than 200 years later, another Assyrian king, Ashurbanipal, has these beautiful stone panels of the lion hunt, showing him proudly riding in chariot as a mighty hunter. These were in his palace in Nineveh. These panels are now in the British Museum, but obviously lions were being hunted in Assyria during Bible times. So even though lions aren't there now, a lot of evidence that says that they were at one point in time. So this then takes us to the, the theory of the land bridge in terms of how all these animals spread to all the different continents. Now, many creationists believe that the Ice Age began about 100 years after the flood, around the Tower of Babel time. And we, we don't see you know, millions and millions of Ice Ages now over you know, millions and millions of years. We believe that there was one ice age that, that started about 100 years after the flood and only lasted about 700 years. Now the oceans then, as a result of the fountains of the great deep breaking forth, that hot lava coming up to spread the continents apart rapidly, would have heated the water. Warm water evaporates more readily than cold water, so the atmosphere would have had a lot more moisture and then you would have all the ash from the volcanoes that would reflect the sunlight back into the atmosphere. So over the continents now, you have cooler temperatures, warm, moist air that precipitates or condenses as snow, and then you have thousands of feet of ice forming on top of the continents. If that ice is on the continents, where is not the water? in the oceans. So that means that sea levels in the past were lower than they are at present time. And there's a lot of good evidence to say that there's many as 400 feet lower in the past than when they are now, which would have opened lots of land bridges, especially across the Siberian, Alaska, the, the Bering Strait there, and also the land bridges here in Panama and many other places. Now, these land bridges then could have easily been routes where animals can move from continent to continent. And in fact, the cold temperatures of the Ice Age probably encouraged or even forced a lot of animals coming out of the north to migrate down into the warmer temperatures here. Ice Age may also even explain the extinction of dinosaurs and woolly mammoths that weren't able to migrate. So is that a problem that some animals couldn't migrate rapid enough to escape the Ice Age? Well, there are some researchers at the Norwegian Polar Institute that have tracked an Arctic fox, and they've traveled, or they've tracked him across three countries and two continents in just 76 days. They put on the fox a satellite tracking device when he was less than a year old, and they tracked him from March 1st, 2018 to July 1st, 2018. And during that time frame, he traveled a total of 2,700 miles in 76 days. That's an average of 29 miles a day with a peak day of 96 miles traveled in one day. So this is good evidence that animals can migrate very rapidly. Those that couldn't possibly die, but that's, that's really strong evidence with science that we have today that says, yeah, animals can migrate fairly rapidly. So here's another viable option, the, the floating log map theory. 
And we look at this, after the flood waters receded, there would have been massive amounts of debris, floating logs, floating vegetation, and that was a result of the flood destroying thousands of square miles of forested land, right? So there would have been massive amounts of logs floating in the water, and these log mats can be fairly dense and can support a lot of weight. Now, the theory says that when these log mats hit landfall, that the animals different species could have migrated onto those log mats, then the wind comes up, blows it out to sea, then those log mats are picked up by the sea currents, and it hits landfall on another continent, another piece of land, and then the animals disembark. Now it sounds kind of like a far-fetched theory. So we're going to look to see if this is really a viable theory or not. These types of log mats are very common in lakes today. In fact, in 1980, when Mount St. Helens erupted, and that's our real-life laboratory today, right? It's a great laboratory to support creationism. But the lateral blast of that volcano and then the mud flows that followed decimated square miles of forest and it deposited those logs in the Spirit Lake. Now keep in mind that this is a fairly small event. Now if you think of the flood then and all the debris that would have been a result after that when all the forests were disrupted and, and uprooted there would have been probably hundreds or thousands of these floating log mats that would have just been tightly packed together with all the other vegetation. And in fact, there is a growing number of evolutionists and secular scientists that are jumping on the log mat theory, so to speak, because they believe it's more of a viable alter alternative than their own. But I would say that creationists are in a better position to defend this log map theory because of the flood. There's a plethora of material that's available for animals to board and go to other continents, whereby uniformitarian scientists only have just a few scraps of lumber floating around, which is far short of what's required to get some of the larger animals to different continents, is it not? Now today, there are many examples of floating islands, both natural and artificial. And these islands many times are made out of like a peaty soil or sphagnum moss that when it decays, it creates a gas and that helps keep it buoyant underneath. And, and many times as they come towards land, the wind blows sediments on, the, on these log mats or these floating vegetation mats. And so you get even trees that grow in the middle, and sometimes animals have seen or have been seen on these floating islands as they've gotten close to shore, animals board, and they go back out into the lake. This happens to be one Lake Blanchemere in France. This is actually a man-made to terror reed island, and this is only one of about 70 different islands in what's called the Euros Island Group in Lake Titicaca in Peru, and people actually live on these reed islands. They, did, they, they built these for kind of a, a defense mechanism, if you will, that they could always be towed out to the middle of the lake for protection. So people actually live on these islands, and periodically they have to cut more reeds and stack them on the top because they're, they're decomposing underneath. But there's about 70 of these. Now there's a man named Chet Van Duzer who studied many of these natural as well as artificial floating islands. And he wrote a book called Floating Islands of Global Bibliography. And in this book he said that floating islands exist on at least six of the seven continents and sometimes in the oceans that separate them. They may have trees growing upon them be hundreds of meters across and support the weight of a hundred cattle grazing on them. So big islands, floating islands, so it gives a little bit more credibility to this floating log map theory. 
Now this happens to be a map then of all the ocean currents, and notice how they kind of swirl around between continents in, in these circular patterns. Now on June 5th of 2012, several thousand castaways rode a massive boxcar sized piece of a damaged dock and it landed on Agate Beach, Oregon, which is just a little bit north of Newport. And there was a plaque on the side of this large dock that said that it was from Japan, Masawa, Japan. A tsunami came through that area and damaged, severely damaged the dock. And that day was March 11, 2011. That dock floated for over a year until it reached the coast of Oregon. Now, the inhabitants then on that dark were 300 marine species of anemones, sponges, oysters, crabs, worms, sea stars, all kinds of sea life. They spent more than a year on this dock drifting almost 5,000 miles across the Pacific Ocean, just following these ocean currents. So think of, keep that in your mind as we're talking about the log mass that may have been floating here with different animal life on them. And actually the, the last well-known modern case of long distance rafting occurred in 1995. There were a dozen more of these green iguanas that were seen jumping off this vegetation mat and swimming the last several meters to shore off of what's called Anguilla Island, which is in the Caribbean. That island was previously iguana-free until that episode happened. So modern example of animals still migrating on floating log mats to populate areas that they didn't live in before. This is an interesting story too. On January 10th, 1992, a cargo ship leaving from Hong Kong was involved in a sea accident here with a, a huge storm. There were three 40-foot shipping containers on this ship that were filled with 29,000 yellow rubber ducats. <laughs> those, those canisters, those containers fell overboard and these friendly floaters appeared on many different continents following. Shortly after, in 1992, several months later, we see them in Indonesia, Australia, South America. In 1994, they had landfall along the Alaskan coast here. Also again in 98, 2001, and 2003. And we also see them migrating here across Greenland, over into England, and then they have landfall here in 2003 in the northeast coast of, of the United States. Pretty interesting that they just followed the ocean currents. What's more interesting is there are several species of plants that also have these split ranges. And it's interesting to note that this particular plant, the hook and the iron, it now grows on the western coast of the United States, around here, the, the coast of Alaska here. We see them in the northeastern portion of the United States and the western coast of South America. Isn't that interesting? But that's exactly where those ocean currents carried those rubber ducks. Pretty intriguing scientific information on how plants can also make that same migratory journey following either a rafting episode on, on log mats or, or some other way following the ocean currents. And we see that most modern animals and plants with these split ranges, they follow those ocean currents around different continents. It's amazing when you look at the evidence for that. So let's dig a little deeper, then that's kind of a broad view of how this happens, but there's still unanswered questions. And one involves marsupials and, and how they migrate. Now, there are three types of mammals 
The first type is called placentals. Those are mammals like the red fox that carry their young inside their bodies until they give birth to fully formed offspring. Then there are the marsupials like the wallabies and the kangaroos. They give birth to their young and then they place them or they crawl into their mother's pouch and that's where they fully develop. And then there's my favorite, they're called the monotremes. These are mammals that lay eggs. And my favorite is the platypus because he lays egg or she lays eggs, nurses her young with breast milk, has a duck bill, webbed feet, has sonar like a bat. It confuses the evolutionists. That's why I like it so much, my favorite animal. Now, the, the question is, why don't we see a lot of these marsupials, like the Tasmanian devil, the, the bushtail possum, the, you know, all these striped possum, the wallabies, the kangaroos, why don't we see them in any other places than Australia? Well, actually, they do live in other places in Australia. There's 334 species of marsupials. 70% of them do live in Australia. 28% live in South America, which leaves 2% of them that live in Central America and North America. <coughs> the Virginia possum is one of those. So don't let anybody tell you that, that marsupials only live in Australia because they do live in other places. The question is, why do they live in only in those regions primarily? And it's possible that they did migrate by ocean currents or whatever other means to other continents, and they just died out because they weren't suited for the environment. Because we do see fossils of marsupials almost on every continent. Now, one of the reasons why they exist more in these southern areas are because they are able to travel farther and faster than any of the placentals or the monotremes. Think about this, if a monotreme hatches eggs or a placental gives birth, they're staying put for a while to nurse their young until they're old enough to migrate, whereas a marsupial, they have the birth, the animal jumps in the pouch, and they're off, right? So bottom line is marsupials can travel farther and faster than any of the other mammals. Now there's also evidence then that placental mammals outcompete marsupials if they're in the same habitat. So if that's the case, if all the, the mammals started in the Middle East, it's quite possible that they were being outcompeted and so they knew they were encouraged to migrate farther south faster and they could faster and then, since they were able to get to these areas quicker, they would have more of a, a possibility to establish a strong foothold in these areas. So when the, marsup when the uh, placentals came, they had already established themselves very solidly in those areas. And the, the, it's possible that the, the placental mammals were outcompeted there. So basically marsupials, the answer to the question is that, that they were established in Australia and South America in the, in the absence of placental mammals because they could migrate faster. Now looking at birds, that's a fairly easy one to describe how different birds got to different continents because they fly, they can fly thousands of miles just like we see birds migrating today. In fact, they could have even island hopped at that time as well. So birds are pretty easy to explain in terms of migration. Insects also can be fairly easy to explain because we see monarch butterflies, they start in their, their mating area in Canada and northeastern United States and they make a trek every year 3,000 miles across land and also across some of the, the Gulf of Mexico to arrive in their destination in southwest southwestern Mexico, 3,000 miles, and that's where they winter. So it's fairly easy to look at insect migration. Now, 
Animal transport by man is also responsible for the distribution of animals between continents. It's clear that men knew how to build ships. Noah built a pretty large ship, didn't he? And he would have passed that information of shipbuilding to his offspring as well, so many of his offspring would have been able to build ships as well. They were certainly capable of that. And trading, as we'll see, would have been common. So let's go back to some of the ancient ships, or the ships of antiquity that we'll call them, that are described in historical documents. This is one that was described by James Usher, or Usher in the Annals of the World. He describes a ship called Leotifra. And it says this was the largest ship of all. It had eight tiers of oars, and she was admired by all for her large size and exquisite construction. In her were a hundred oars per tier, so on each side there were 800 rowers, which made 1,600 in all. That's, folks, that's eight tiers with a hundred oars per tier. That's a fairly large boat. Large boat. Here's another one. It's called the, the warship of Ptolemy Philopter. This was in 244 to 205 BC. And, and this was a ship that was described by Athanasius. It said it was 400 feet and 22 feet long, or 420 feet long, 57 feet wide, and 72 feet high. This is essentially, depending upon the size of the cubit that you use, this is the size the ark was. So large boat, yet even in the 244 BC. It says, from the top of her stern post to the water line was 79 and a half feet. It has four steering oars, 45 feet long, and 40 banks of oars, with oars on the upper tier being 57 feet long. This ship was manned by, it says, 7,250 men. Large ships at that time that were seaworthy to go to different areas, not only populate the world, but to transport animals possibly as well. And we see again, going back to the true source of the Bible, we see the Queen of Sheba presenting Solomon with different gifts. First Kings 10, starting at verse 10, it says, She gave the king 120 talents of gold, large quantities of spices, and precious stones, Never again were so many spices brought in those, in as those the Queen of Sheba gave to King Solomon. Hiram's ships, reference to ships, brought gold from Ophir, and from there they brought great cargoes of almond wood and precious stones. So the Queen of Sheba was sending ships to many different regions. Also, 1 Kings 10, 22 says the king, speaking of Solomon, had a fleet of trading ships at sea along with the ships of Hiram. And once every three years, it returned carrying gold, silver, and ivory, and apes, and bamboos. Now, if these ships returned every three years, they would have been large ships that carried a lot of cargo to keep all this, the ship personnel alive. So we see now carrying apes and baboons. Now, there, there's this word for baboon is a Hebrew word that is tekiyim. It only occurs one other time in Scripture. That's Second Chronicles chapter nine verse twenty-one. So we don't have a lot of good history in terms of the context of whether that meant baboons. Many of the people think that it meant peacock. But in the context, along with apes, it seems to fit better that it was baboons instead. But nonetheless, whatever the animal was, they are shipping and trading animals along their trade routes as well. So now this brings us to the question of fish. And, and maybe I'm the only one here that's ever wondered this, but did anybody else ever wonder how freshwater fish were kept alive in saltwater oceans during the flood? And we got some people shaking their heads. So we have to answer a couple of questions here. First of all, how salty were the oceans before the flood and then during the flood? And then what was the, the salinity tolerance of the fish at that time? So let's, let's ponder both of those. So we don't really know how salty the ocean was before the flood. 
we can surmise that it was probably less salty. But to begin with, the flood was initiated again by the fountains of the great deep breaking forth, and, and that would have brought up you know, the magma heating the water, so you'd have hot water and you'd have steam, and that's always associated with these, these cataclysmic volcanic eruptions. Now, waters like that today that we see from these hot plumes are heavy in minerals, salty minerals. So the water would have become saltier after the flood when the fountains of the great deep broke forth. And then remember, at the end of the flood, when God raised up the mountains, all the water shed off. This would have been a huge erosional event. The earth has a lot of earth salts, a lot of minerals then that are salty that ended up in the ocean, again, increasing the salt content. So we do know, or we can at least easily surmise, that the oceans were less salty before the flood, and possibly even during the flood, than they are today. <coughs> now, the other interesting thing is that fresh water is less dense than salt water, meaning that it's lighter. So there are pockets of fresh water that float on the salt water. And we even see that today, there are pockets of fresh water that do float on top of salt water. Just look at all the different freshwater rivers that flow into the salty oceans. The Amazon is a great example of that. When you see at the mouth of the Amazon, there are huge pockets of fresh water on top of salt water that doesn't mix for years. So it's very possible then that these freshwater pockets can float above without mixing we see that in these rivers that dump out, and then fish then could have survived in these floating freshwater pockets during the flood and even after the flood for a while. The other thing we know that there are many species of fish today that are more highly specialized, right? We see how genetic variation dissipates with each successive generation, you lose genes. So the fish today are very highly specialized, and they don't survive with radically different, you know, uh, salinity tolerances today compared to their original habitat. Now there are some fish that do have a wider range of salinity tolerances, but some are very specialized today. But that doesn't mean that that's the way it was at the time of the flood. And we know that there are many fish today, such as the sea run trout. Atlantic sturgeon, the salmon, the striped bass, smelt, American shad, hickory shad, lamprey, all of those fish, just to name a few, they lay their eggs in fresh water, then they migrate out to sea, to salt water, where they spend most of their adult life, only to come back <coughs> again to fresh water to spawn. On the other hand, you've got sea lice such as the North American eel, the European eel, the Ananga, both short and long fin eels that actually live their adult life in fresh water and they go out to seawater to spawn. So they all have to be able to reverse this process of removing salt and water compared to what their environment is to be able to survive. So that's just some diversity that God has built in to sea life, that, and that those are genes that possibly could have been passed on to at least the fish that live in both salt water and fresh water. Does that make sense to everybody? It's, it's really just a matter of genetics and how those genes get transferred to different species. So kind of summing up then, it's, it's not really difficult then when we look at the continents and where we see these split range animals that they either migrated via land bridges during that time when there was ice ages and, and much more of the land was exposed, or they rafted to different places, or they were traded by ships by various different people groups. And, and I would say any combination of those methods then that we see today are extremely rational to say, oh yeah, this is how it happened. 
So now we have answers that we can share to people and ask these questions. But the critical thing is, we always start from this. Yeah, I like this. An emergency, break the glass. That's where we need to start. Because those who, who have different assumptions to begin with will have radically different answers. So it all really depends on what your presuppositions are. Now there's plenty of scientific evidence to support any one of these biblical models, but as I said before, models come, models go. These models are some that we see today occurring. Scientists have actually bought into some of these creation models because they make more sense. But that doesn't mean that there couldn't be different models that surface over time that have just as legitimate answers. But we have to remember that doesn't discount the Bible. It's just we don't know how God provided for his cre creation until something new comes. But what we do know, we always have to start with, he with this book and never deviate from this. If there's a theory or a model out there that's different from what the Bible says, we need to discount it. But God has left us with his word and it's true. We can trust it. In 2 Corinthians 4, verse 6, it says, For God who said, Let light shine out of darkness, he made his light to shine in our hearts to give us the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Christ. So he has opened up our eyes and given us knowledge, not only of Christ, but how we can interpret his word and to share the gospel to other people. And that, again, that's really what it's, it's about, is not being right or wrong but being able to point people to the truth of God's word and how it makes more sense than man's fallible theories, and then we have an open door to present the gospel to people. And that's why we're, we're doing what we're doing, so that you folks have the answers for the hope that lies within you that you can share with jealousy and respect. That being said, does that answer some questions about how the animals got to different kinds? I need to share what's on my heart to give evidence for the hope that lies within us. And Lord, we do pray that we would be able to take this information to share with other people that, that do have differing views, not to win arguments, not to prove that we're right, but to prove that your word is true and open the door to present your gospel so that we can ultimately bring more people into your kingdom. Father, I pray that you would give us your Holy Spirit and the power of your Holy Spirit to reach out to people and give us confidence to do exactly that. Lord, I pray that you'd be with each one of us tonight as we go our way, protect each one, and bring them back safely next week as we study more of your word. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, everybody, for coming.